I want to explain, and that's very hard for people to understand, that there are strategic thinkers who say, I'll sacrifice a thousand or two thousand people of my own to make everybody so angry that after that I can really go to war. Today I have a fascinating conversation with Dr. Daniele Ganser. Daniele is a Swiss historian who is all about uncovering the hidden and often darker stories of history, stories that not everybody is happy to see in the light of day. In the following interview we are going to take a closer look at his life and work, as well as some of the topics that he has investigated in the span of his career. Born back in 72 in beautiful Lugano, Switzerland, Daniele Ganser started his academic journey early and went on to make a PhD in history from the University of Basel. As you will hear, he wrote his thesis on a topic that virtually the highest echelons of power in both the US and Europe had hoped to have been buried for good. So now you know that, despite his calm demeanor, Daniele really means business. But what sets him apart from the pack is his research. Once he has locked onto a target, he turns every historical stone, every page of every research paper or publication, to make sure nothing's missed. Whether it's classified documents, dusty archives or interviews with the world's darkest characters, he's on a mission to expose the hidden stories that have shaped and still do shape the fate of our nations. And here is where things get tricky. Some interest groups have, in a concerted effort, slapped the conspiracy theorist label on Daniele for attacking some of the most sensitive subjects. Remember, when logical arguments fail, when objective facts don't change the minds, then simplified labels and stereotypes are thrown around by those whose interests are threatened by the truth. And if that's not working, then out come the curveballs. One for example is the fact that due to pressure coming from the United States, I kid you not, Daniele actually lost his Kashi University position. It's a stark reminder of the tricky balance between academic freedom and external political influence. At the time of writing, believe it or not, people and journalists in Europe are fired from their jobs or even arrested just for wearing the flag of a particular country or for questioning the current mainstream narrative. In this climate, access to critical voices like Daniele's might, one not to distant day in the future, belong to the past. The writings are on the wall for all who have eyes to see and Daniele will tell us in the interview the perfect example of how it's done. So as we dive into this interview, remember that Daniele is a researcher who is all about academic vigor and shedding light on the darkest side of history. It's not about promoting conspiracy theories, it's an ongoing battle to expose an admittedly uncomfortable truth. Since we cover quite a number of topics, I have listed them below in the timestamps if you want to skip ahead. And now let's get ready for a very candid conversation. Daniele Ganser, glad to having you. How is it today in Switzerland? Hi Thomas, thanks for inviting me. We have a wonderful sunny autumn day here in Switzerland. Great. A little bit of back story. Yeah? Normally when I hear as, a, as an interviewer, I reach out to people and normally if I'm told, you know, call me back in half a year or so, I know what it means. Yeah? In your case, it was doubly different. Yeah. First of all, we have this interview now, so really appreciate. And sure. second, in your case, I was happy to hear that you're busy, that you are really getting the message out. Yeah. I yeah. followed the, the controversy, where was it in Stuttgart or in Dortmund? Yeah, by the Dortmund. major. Yeah. Please tell us the story. Uh, I'm giving talks on international politics. I'm a historian. I'm 51 years old and I give talks in Germany, Switzerland and Austria. So in the German speaking world, that's a hundred million people who live in Austria, Switzerland and Germany together. And in Dortmund, I gave a talk um, in the beginning of this year and we had already uh, sold 2000 tickets. So we were sold out. There, was, there were no more tickets. And then the government of the city, which was a social democrat uh, government, said, no, cancer cannot give this talk. And the topic of the talk was Ukraine. Uh, and I basically said in my talk that Germany should not send weapons into Ukraine. 
uh, because the, the conflict is a very complicated one and the US overthrew the government in Kiev 2014 and the Russian even invasion is illegal, but the US coup d'etat is also illegal. So, th and then the government really, I mean, it was funny, you know, that the government really tries to stop free speech in Germany and we really had to go to the court and then the, the court said, no, of course, Ganser can talk. Um, this, is, this is still free speech. He, he can have his analysis on the war in Ukraine. Uh, and if the government disagrees, they cannot just stop his talk. And then I could give the talk. And this is a phenomenon that, is, that goes on worldwide and not just in dictatorships, but by us in the Western so-called democratic countries. Yeah. <clears throat> Voices silenced. So I did a little experiment. Yeah, I work a lot with ChatGPT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I ask ChatGPT, who is Daniele Ganser? And I'm doing <laughs> this specifically because I did actually a video on analyzing Chat, how biased ChatGPT actually is. Okay. And I, I used the example of Israel. We have some, let's say, specialized knowledge because then I interviewed a number of the new historians which had access to privileged data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And over the course of about 10, 15 minutes conversation on ChatGPT, I kind of had to bend ChatGPT's arms to finally commit, sorry, uh, admit that the facts that I have mentioned are true. Yeah, and you can see this whole progress. And in your case, I have it here in front of me. Okay. Daniele Ganser, it's not very long. Yeah? Daniele Ganser is a Swiss historian known for his research on geopolitics, energy security and international relations. Then it says when you're born. Yeah. And then we have three points, yeah. NATO secret armies, that's what you're, that's what you're known for. Gladiator, yeah, we can discuss. 9-11, conspiracy theories. I mean, that's not something new for you anyway, yeah. yeah. And then energy and geopolitics, yeah. yeah. It's important to note that Gans's viewpoint and research have been met with criticism from mainstream scholars and experts in various fields in, in, that, in that trend, yeah. On one side, having had the experience that I just described, I'm surprised it's not more negative. Yeah. Okay, it's, so, we have, it's pretty good. <laughs> well, the, it's, um, it's Thomas, relative. The, the, my Wikipedia entry is yeah. really bad. Yeah. When I when I read my Wikipedia entry, I, it's like this feeling. I don't want to. I don't want to meet this guy. You know, it, you know yourself, and then you see mm -hmm. how how the world or not the world. It's basically just this online uh, lexicon. So, so I'm glad to hear how the how chat GPT. I, I think my son once came back and he said. Your, your chat GBT entry is much better than your Wikipedia entry. And I was going, what is chat GBT? I didn't, didn't even know what it is. <laughs> how old is your son? How old, how old is your son? He's 15. Okay, okay. Then he knows. Yeah. So they I know, follow. Yeah. I myself, I follow you for at least 10, 15 years. I'm not entirely sure. Long time. Yeah. I saw many, many, many of your interviews, your, your lectures. Uh, you wrote many books, two of which I have here. I don't know if you can see this one here. That's the newest one, I think, from, from 2020. Empire, yep. or the Scrupulous Empire. Yeah. You see, it was translated into English. So this is the German version, and this yeah. is the English yeah. version. And then I have another one, Ill yep. Illegal Wars. Yeah. Yep. I know we both speak a couple of languages, so if I have the chance, I still read in the original language, and German is my mother tongue. Mm -hmm. So that my mother, when I come home after 30 years of absence, she says to me, Thomas, you're forgetting your language. So to keep it up, I read these kind of books. Yeah, very, I can highly, highly recommend it for anyone. Uh, Empire USA is an eye opener. Thanks a lot. And we, will dis and we will discuss this today. Okay. So very briefly, with, the, with all that's happening right now, so we were all preoccupied with Ukraine, which we will discuss. Russian, as so the proxy war between the US and, and, uh, and, and Russia in Ukraine. Yep. And now then this happens a week ago, yeah? Hamas, Hamas attacks and the response, the predictable response now from Israel. Yeah? And you and me, we just discussed this prior to this uh, interview. There are one or two parallels and maybe you describe the parallel it has this happening right now with Pearl Harbor. Yeah, um, I mean, I do get a lot of, you know, mails and information now during the last seven days uh, focusing on this conflict between um, Palestine and Israel. And obviously it's a very, very long conflict which started in 1948 with the creation of Israel. And I'm not going to go into all these details, but what, what uh, Israeli journalists point out is that they're very um, surprised that when Hamas started the attack, that they first could sort of open the fence. You know, they say the fence is a very strong fence. 
so that's the fence which is which is really going around the Gaza Strip. So in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, with more than two million people, and you cannot just walk out. So there's a very strong fence, border fence. It's not like North Korea, South Korea. That that probably is even a, a strong fence there. And it's not like the Berlin Wall because the Berlin Wall was really made out of bricks. And the fence, the Gaza fence, is 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 just a fence. But there's you know shooting uh, systems there and everything. And they yeah. say it's very strange that you can move out. Um, out of that system, and one one uh, Israeli uh, journalist uh, who I've seen on the internet only, she says she worked when she was in the army in the Israeli army. She was at the fence. So that's 20 years ago, and she says at the time uh, when a cat was moving along that fence, you had an alert signal, mm -hmm. and and now you have Hamas breaking out, and and, and they're killing more than a thousand Israelis. So, so on 29 so, places, huh? they broke out yeah. on 29 places. Yeah. So that is really that is now being discussed. Is this possible? And and how uh, did they did Be Benjamin Netanyahu? I mean, the prime minister was under pressure. We know that there were people demonstrating against him in Israel a lot. You know, day after day. So he was not a prime minister who had the full support of the population. Much to the contrary, he was really. He was under a lot of pressure. And then um, suddenly Hamas breaks out and has three hours, five hours. We still have to really break that down when the first reaction of the Israeli military is. But the sources that I have right now is that we have three hours where Hamas just, you know, goes ramsack and kills people. And I'm, I mean, it's just a week ago, so I still don't know. I really still don't know what happened, but it's something we need to look at. And you mentioned Pearl Harbor um, in, in this book, U.S. The Ruthless Empire. I said on 7 December 1941, the U.S. entered the Second World War. And the crucial moment was the attack of the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. And it has long been portrayed as a total surprise, so that the U.S. government and the U.S. population and the U.S. soldier uh, on, on Hawaii and Pearl Harbor were totally suppressed. But when I looked at the data, I, I said, wait, we have to make a distinction here between the U.S. government. They were not surprised. President Roosevelt was not surprised. He and his cabinet, so that's the foreign minister and the defense minister, they knew that the attack was coming. The American population was suppressed, of course, and the soldiers in Pearl Harbor, they, who 2,400 were killed, uh, so now even more than uh, now the Israelis. I think there's a, a thousand, a, a thousand, five hundred, three hundred. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's say a thousand, three hundred Israelis were killed by Hamas on 7 October 23. Um, on Pearl Harbor, we had 2,400 uh, American soldiers killed, and the data that I have, it takes a very long time for historians to really look um, how, how this all worked. And for Pearl Harbor, I'm very sure. I'm not sure about Hamas and Israel, but I'm very sure for Pearl Harbor. Mm. And what happened on Pearl Harbor was Lehop let it happen on purpose. And that is when a government lets an attack happen in order to consolidate um, public opinion. It basically means, I mean, it's very cruel, but it, what that's, that's being done. You sacrifice 2,400 people, and then you say the Japanese attacked. And in fact, they did attack. You know, it's like Hamas. They did attack. There's no, no question about it. But Roosevelt, who was president in the United States at the time, he really provoked the attack because he first cut off the oil supply to Japan. I mean, Japan has no oil at all. The U.S. was sending in all the oil. And then at, uh, a few months before uh, the attack, the U.S. just shut off the oil supply. So you actually have a Japanese ship, you know, going empty, an oil ship going empty from Japan across the Pacific to the U.S. And it goes back empty. And that was the total shock to Japan because then they were calculating, we're not getting any oil anymore from the U.S. That means our war, they were already waging war in the Southeast Asia. Uh, we, need, we, 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 we cannot fly any, uh, uh, any planes anymore. We cannot, without oil, you can, can't do any war. So that was the first step. The U.S. shut off the 
the oil. The second step that they did, they had the US Navy in California, okay? And the commander was Admiral Richardson. And then Roosevelt told him, you know what? The, the base, the headquarters of the Pacific Fleet, we're now moving it from California to Pearl Harbor. And then Admiral Richardson said, no way, that's a stupid idea. Why should we have the base of the Pacific Fleet that far out in, in, in the Pacific Ocean? I mean, the soldiers during a weekend, you know, they want to go home uh, to see their girlfriends. And, or if we want to have um, supplies, material, logistics supplies, it's much easier in California than to have that in, on Pearl Harbor. And uh, Roosevelt just fired Richardson, and he replaced it with him with Admiral Kimmel. Admiral Kimmel then, you know, as 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 as, uh, pre as the president wanted, moved headquarters of the Pacific Fleet out to Hawaii. And that is like if you put the meat and you put it very close to the line. Okay, you just put the meat closer to the lion's cave. Uh, closer to Japan. Japan, in this um, sense, is the lion, and the meat is, is, is Pearl Harbor, it's the Pacific base. And the third thing we know as a fact is that the U.S. government was able to intercept all intelligence, so they knew what the Japanese uh, were talking. And I think it is very likely that Mossad can intercept all communication in the Gaza Strip. NSA, National Security Agency, probably can intercept everything. And you know, it's not, it's not the case that they don't speak any Arabic or so. No, but <laughs> if I may, we know that the Egyptians warned uh, Israel. Yeah, we know we that. We do know, we know, we they know. know. That. Yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, for me, it's easier to talk about 1941 than to talk about 2023. Yeah. Because in 1941, I can really explain that it was a let, let it happen per, on purpose uh, operation. And uh, the responsible Secret Service was the Office of Na Naval Intelligence, ONI. And one of the members of the ONI uh, said after the attack, he said 2,400 killed was a relatively cheap price that we had to pay um, to create consent within the US population that we had to fight against Japan and Germany. So. You know, there are strategic players, and that's the only thing uh, I want to explain, and then I, I'll cut it. It's a very long answer. But I want to explain, and that's very hard for people to understand, that there are strategic thinkers who say, I'll sacrifice a thousand or two thousand people of my own to make everybody so angry that after that I can really go to war. And the technique is called um, let the enemy uh, fire first and uh, that will create outrage and then the rest will follow. So maybe that happened in, in, on, in the Gaza Strip now. I'm not sure yet, but I'm really looking at it. Just a last question on the topic. I don't want to expand it too much. Yeah? But let's say there was some interest of letting that happen. Yeah? With what goal, as far as you can tell from that point of view? You, you mentioned already Netanyahu was very much under pressure, demonstrations, right wing, whatever. Yeah, but I think that exceeds Netanyahu. I think that's more in you know the whole I government. Mean, so, well, the Israeli goal is always uh, security. Okay, the, the, every government in Israel who is in power wants security, and one idea to have security is just to destroy Gaza and the West Bank completely. You know, get rid of the West Bank, get rid of the Gaza Strip move all the Palestinians out of the country. So that is one idea. I don't think that is correct. I don't think it works. You don't have security even if you do that. But that would be, that would be a strategic idea that, that, that Benjamin mm. Netanyahu could, could have. But I, I can't really you know, put myself in, in the head of Netanyahu. Mm. Uh, but but he, was, he, he, has now, he has now the possibility to, yeah. to, to, to bomb uh, the Gaza Strip. Yeah, but he was only three months ago. He was in front of the UN showing this famous, you know, picture of Green, the, the Greater Israel. But, yeah. So, coincidence or not? Okay. I don't know. I mean, he he certainly has the idea. It'd be good to get rid of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. But mm. if you do that, you know, just thinking about it, if that is is being done, it has to be said that a lot of Israelis disagree. 
a lot of Israelis, a lot of Jews worldwide disagree and say, no, don't do that, it's not a good idea. Let's try to, to live in peace together. That's the only thing we can do. Uh, but uh, obviously there, there are hardliners who say uh, the only way is, is really to destroy the enemy. I mean, that, if, you, if you go back to, to Pearl Harbor, it really ended with the, with the US dropping two atomic bombs in Japan. I mean, um, we have seen cycles of violence uh, before in history, and uh, I think the peace movement, I just, you know, try to support the peace movement as you do. I think the peace movement on, on both the Israeli side as well as the Palestinian side um, says, uh, no, uh, we, can't, we can't solve this with, with violence. We've tried. We've tried for many, many decades. It doesn't work. Yeah. And now I have a gateway into Iran because Iran is now peddled as the mastermind, so to speak, although there are no clear evidence yet. But even if there's no... I, I heard uh, Lindsey Graham, for example, yesterday, yeah? Even if there's no concrete evidence yet, and he was specifically asked by CNN yeah, on that topic, even if there's no specific evidence, would you still attack Iran? And he says yes. Yeah. Let me just, um, let me just understand yeah, you, yes, just sorry. to be clear. You're saying yeah. that you would want the United States and Israel to bomb Iran, even in the absence you of direct it. evidence of their involvement in this uh, attack. Yeah. But the whole question of Iran, yeah, and maybe that's for you as a historian to, to elaborate, most people have no clue why Iran, or why we are in the situation with the West, with Iran, as we were, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm just mentioning Kermit, Kermit Roosevelt, yeah, I have his book, so I, I, we know what's done, so, but maybe you elaborate. Yeah. I'll and why, why they're immediately trying to shoot on Iran, why Iran is still on the axis of evil, which has changed slightly from Bush to, <laughs> to Biden, right? There's different countries now. But let's, yeah, let's begin I, with Iran. It's in the book as well. And uh, I, in the book, I explain that Iran was the first country where British Petroleum, BP, discovered oil. It was not Saudi Arabia. It was not Kuwait. It was not Iraq. It was Iran. That was in 1908, so, you know, more than 100 years ago. And then the British, who then were the world, uh, world's most powerful uh, nation, it was not the US, it was not China, it was the British before World War I, then they exploited Iranian resources. They took the oil and, and, and made a fortune. So, you know, that's classical uh, exploitation within a capitalist system. And then the Iranians, after some years, said, Jesus Christ, our kids don't have anything to eat, they have no education, and all the money is going to London. We don't want that. And then they nationalized the oil. And the prime minister who nationalized the oil in, in Iran was Mossadegh. Now Mossadegh is not, you know, he's not very well known here in Switzerland. If you walk around and say, who, do you know Prime Minister Mossadegh? Do you remember him? They go, no, I, don't, I never heard of the guy. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you probably know him, but many people don't, have never heard of Mohammed. He was a Mohammed. teacher and he was a moderate. Yeah, but m most people have totally forgotten about him. And he was overthrown by the CIA and the MI6. So again, the secret services of the British and the Americans, they overthrew Mossadegh in 1953. So that really is when the whole problem started. Uh, it was basically NATO countries. I mean, the US is a NATO country and Great Britain is a NATO country who went into um, Iran overthrowing a government for, uh, for oil interest, for capitalistic interests, really. And uh, they uh, introduced the Shah, put the Shah in power. And then in 79, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini overthrew the Shah uh, and installed yeah, a radical uh, Islamist um, government. So had, had, had the West not intervened in Iran, you know, Iran would not have gone into this uh, radicalization. It's, it's very similar like the CIA training the Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, you know. Um, or Israel financing Hamas. Israel fin financing Hamas. That's all things coming up now uh, that in, in, in the intelligence community you call a blowback. Um, you know, th things go wrong sometimes. You, you, you achieve an aim that you have. I mean, they had access to Iranian oil after the coup. 
But in the long run, um, the uh, situation within Iran uh, deteriorated. And, and, and today, the US and Iran, or Israel and Iran, are on opposing sides. And Iran, very important point, has now been accepted as a new member of the BRICS. BRICS. It, Iran yes. will join the BRICS in January 2024. The BRICS, obviously, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they're, they're, they used to be just five. Now Iran is coming in in January. Saudi Arabia. Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia, Egypt, Argentina, uh, Ethiopia. A few, a few countries coming in. The Emirates are coming in. So the BRICS are getting bigger. They are now 3.5 billion. Well, they will be in January. And the NATO countries is 1 billion inhabitants. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's very important from a geostrategic perspective, it's very important to see that Iran is part of the BRICS, is part of the 3.5 billion group, and the NATO group, that's our group. I mean, you're, you're based in the Netherlands, right? Yeah. And I'm based, so the Netherlands is a NATO country, and... Uh, Switzerland is not a NATO country, but w which is following the NATO policies without, you know, we're also, um, you know, participating in this um, economic war against Russia. So, so we're not sending weapons into Ukraine, but we lost our neutrality. I mean, our government has, has really let us down by, by just saying you can vote on everything, but not on that important topic. And I'm, I'm quite angry about that. I mean... How can a government say we are a direct democracy country, which we are in Switzerland? We can vote on, you know, whether we sh should build a second tunnel through the Gotthard, so th one of the big mountains. But then when they jump into that NATO war against Russia, we didn't have a say. OK, that was in last year, yeah, 2022. And uh, so Switzerland is, is surrounded by NATO country because uh, Germany obviously is a NATO country, France is a NATO country, Italy is a NATO country. Austria is not really in NATO. They're like Switzerland, neutral, but we're not neutral. Austria is not neutral right now. Switzerland is not neutral. We are we're very much against, um, well, our government is very much against Russia. But I want to emphasize what the Swiss government does and what citizens like me, I'm a Swiss citizen, think is quite two different things. And that's the same in Israel. What the Israeli government does, what Benjamin Netanyahu does, and what the um, what many Israelis think is quite a different thing, or what Hamas does and what many Palestinians think are quite different things, or what in, in America, what Roosevelt did with Pearl Harbor, and what many Americans wanted, many wanted to stay out of the Second World War. They were so-called isolationists. So it's very important to keep the government and the population apart. <laughs> mm. Roosevelt was elected on the promise not to enter the war. You're right. And he broke that promise and he broke it in a way which was very, very cunning. Uh, and people just didn't realize at the time. But now we know. Now we know at the time it was impossible and they didn't have YouTube to talk about it seven days after it happened like we can now. I mean, this is the we're living in the information revolution. You have people talking in, on it on Twitter or X already now. That was that was impossible uh, back then in, in 1941. I always explain that to to the kids, you know, or to the to the 20 year olds or, or 15 year olds. I say, you know, there was a time we didn't have the Internet. And they look at me like. What? You gotta be kidding, right? You had no internet, <laughs> mm -hmm. so you had no YouTube. No, no, you had no Twitter, no Facebook, no nothing. You didn't even have. You didn't have that. I'm like, no. If if I may, very briefly, I work in IT. Mm. What we consider as, you know, something normal as water or waste disposal, yeah, requires an army of people around the world, twenty four seven, to keep up. Mm -hmm. Now, when I heard about the Nord Stream pipelines, which I would like to discuss, yeah, yeah, Nord Stream, uh, very. Important. I thought, guys, you know, I wouldn't throw a stone if I would sit in a glass house. You know, what's still on, what else is on the ground there? Our live arteries, our wests, information highways. They are on this same ocean bottom, and it's very easy to sabotage them. Yeah, our life as we know it would end. The bakers can't bake bread anymore. You will not get. 
energy, everything is regulated. Yeah? So it's very tricky in, in, in that respect not to overstate how, you know, the more technological advancement we have, the more sensitive, the more fragile the whole system gets. It's right? true. It's true. It's critical infrastructure, isn't it? Yeah, maybe we jump right away. I have still some, yeah, but maybe because I mentioned North Stream, yeah. Yeah. I interviewed Jeffrey Sachs and Noam yeah. Chomsky on the topic yeah. just before Christmas. Yeah? yeah, they were they were clear. For them, it was clear. It was done by America one way or another. It was with America. Yeah? Then Simon Hirsch came out. Fascinating yeah. story. But yeah. I'm also a behavior analyst. Then the US came out with this ridiculous story from the yacht where they found actually samples of the explosive on the kitchen table. Also, yeah. two things, two things immediately. I'm a diver. Yeah, You yeah. do not dive to 80 meters below the sea. You need decompression tanks, you need equipment, you need experience. Yeah. And second, whoever planted the bomb, they didn't, you know, kind of manufacture it on a good kitchen table. This story is so ludicrous. Yeah. yeah so exactly. coming back to you. Yeah, I mean, I see it like, like you, you see it. I mean, I also did some diving. We, we went down to 30 meters. That was it. I never went to 80 meters. So 30 meters was okay. Usually we went to 20 meters or 15 meters was fun. You know, that's the normal diving range where you, where you sell a lot of fish. And just recently I was diving in, in Egypt and, and saw dolphins. So it was great. But if we, if we talk about North Stream, I'm fully with, uh, with the analysis of Seymour Hirsch. Yeah. I mean, Seymour Hirsch says, uh, Joe Biden said, we're going to take it out. And in fact, we have public testimony of Joe Biden. Where, 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 that was the moment when Olaf Scholz visited uh, yep. the United States in February uh, 22. That's, and it's very important to remember. In February 22, imp two important things happened. Obviously, on the 24th of February 2022, we had the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, which I consider illegal. You cannot invade in just another country, but we can talk about this later. But before this invasion, um, I think it was February 8 or so, I would have to look it up, but uh, Olaf Scholz was, was in Washington. And then a journalist asks uh, President Biden, well, if you say North Stream is not going to happen, uh, how are you going to stop it? And then he says, we have our ways, you know, we know how to do it. I and mean, he doesn't say we're going to blow it up, but in public, Joe Biden says, we'll stop it. And when, when after the uh, terrorist attack, and it clearly was a terrorist attack on German infrastructure, um, after the pipelines were blown up, you actually have Victoria Nuland, who, who was, that's, she's, she's the neocon lady uh, in, in the foreign department who also... Kiev. Uh, yeah, he, he, she, was, she was doing the coup d'etat in Kiev on 20 February 2014. And she said in the American Senate, I'm quite happy, you know, that Nord Stream has been reduced to a bit of rubble uh, on the bottom of, uh, of the sea. So you have the president who says, well, take it, we'll stop that. And you have one of the chief responsible planners, Victoria Newland, who says, I'm happy that this pipeline is destroyed. I mean, as a historian, I can tell you, you don't get much closer to a terrorist attack than that, because Seymour Hirsch uh, obviously has, has, uh, has sources within the White House, within the CIA, or within the Pentagon. We don't really know where his sources are, but they're very highly placed. And Seymour Hirsch has a track record with Abu Ghraib, um, um, Vietnam, with Vietnam as well. Uh, so he, he, really, he, he really has a track uh, record of speaking truth to power. And he has, for me, very clearly explained how it was done, because he says it was done during the ball tops exercise. And that's very clever, you know, to do it then because then you have a lot of ships in, 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 in the Ostsee, and uh, that was the moment to do it. And the exercise, the Baltops exercise, was in June 22, and then they, they had the, the explosives laying there. And in September, September 26, they just activated the explosive. So, you know, they, they put a, a delay into it, and that's, that's, militarily speaking, that's the smart way to do it. Don't put the explosive there and then you know, have it explode on the same day, put it there during an exercise, and then it can rest there uh, for a few few months, and then in September, blow it up. So yes, for me, this is a terrorist attack of the of the Biden administration on, on European infrastructure. And it is just 
crazy that Olaf Scholz doesn't say a word. He doesn't say a word. He and, said, and, uh, we do everything together. And I'm mimicking now Ray McGovern, who told me exactly that on, uh, on the interview with him. So Schulz was like a sheep next to Biden on that interview. It was just shameful to see. Shameful, very shameful. Yeah. And there, it was also very shameful to see that then Olaf Scholz, Chancellor of Germany, from Berlin takes a plane, flies to Washington, has a secret meeting with Joe Biden, no press allowed, no, um, uh, no questions allowed. And then after that meeting, you have the New York Times coming out with, the, uh, with that story. Oh, you know, with six Ukrainians on, the, mm. on that yacht, Andromeda, who did it. You have, uh, I think, The Economist pushed the story, uh, German ARD post the story Spiegel, Süddeutsche. So you have basically have all mainstream news channels who push the story. A few Ukrainians did it. They, and, and the, everybody who looks at it goes like, are these news groups, are they all so closely connected that they now push this story and, and, and say, well, Seymour Hirsch is an old man and he's crazy and probably he's a conspiracy nut and whatever. I mean, to every objective observer, it becomes clear that, that they are presenting a cover story. And by that, they discredit themselves. I mean, the New York Times, you know, they, they still have a standing in some places, not everywhere. Uh, Der Spiegel or the Süddeutsche Zeitung, RLD, they still have a standing here and there. But if you look at their reporting on Nord Stream, it's, it's ridiculous. There was also this, uh, this uh, Twitter tweet from the Polish foreign minister, right? Yeah, Where he thanked basically the thanked, yeah. And I have some one from, from uh, Germany, Sarah Wagenknecht. Yeah, she's a parla parliamentarian, he, and she asked the government. And the government said they cannot give it to her the information because of national security. It's just crazy. Yeah, it's if the Russian would have done this, you know, that would be broadcast, broadcasted around the world. Then yeah, Sweden. And, and you know, one one important thing, Thomas, is that I've seen that there are four pipelines. So two are Nord Stream one, and two are Nord Stream two, and. Nord Stream 1 was put into place in 2011, so it's been operating for 10 years, more than 10 years. And the good thing for Germany with Nord Stream 1 was that they basically get cheap gas from Russia. And if you, if you combine cheap resources from Russia with, with uh, German industry, that's a very strong combination. So as George Friedman in the US has always said, we don't want you know, Russia and Germany to, co to cooperate. Together, they're really strong. So we, we, we want them to kill each other or fight each other. And so it really was in the US interest to cut this cooperation. But I've seen that uh, Russian President Putin has recently said only three of the pipelines are destroyed. One is still intact. Now, I'm not sure that is true. It has to be checked. But he says, despite this attack, uh, this American attack, it seems that they did not take out all four pipelines. It seems that they took out three. God only knows why they didn't destroy four. <laughs> I mean, come on, if, if you destroy it, you destroy it completely. But Putin says one is still intact. I'm not sure whether that's the same uh, information that you get. But it would mean that it, even as we speak today, Russia could send um, uh, gas to Germany. Is that the same information that you hear? I I heard about it, but I'm not sure how credible that is. Yeah. yeah On the other hand, we know we, we know that the French still get up till up until recently got nuclear material from from Russia. So I would not be surprised if Germany under the carpet still gets some gas. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying they're getting. I'm just saying Russia still has infrastructure of these four Nord Stream pipelines. Three are definitely out. And now Putin is saying one is still, you know, is still there. We could use it if Germany says, mm. send us some gas. Now, I'm not sure. I, I, I would like to see some reaction from Germany. Well, that is also their analysis there that they could get uh, gas from Russia mm. uh, on a technical level. I know that they don't, but they, if, if the pipeline is there, uh, you know, this cooperation between Germany and Russia could resume. I know that Scholz doesn't want that. I know that he doesn't want that. But the German industry is in great distress yeah. because basically they don't have energy. Well, they do have energy, but it's now much more much expensive because they have to take liquefied natural gas from, from the from US. US. <laughs> and, and, you know, it just, it just, it's just a real burden on the German yeah. economy. It's a real yeah. burden. So it's not a small so, issue. No. And 
it's also a long-standing objective from NATO. Yeah? So uh, Lord Ismay, who was the first NATO general secretary, he said already, the aim of NATO is to keep Russia out, Germany down, and America in. Yeah? And you find on the internet, if you search for Lord Ismay restated, a whole list yeah, of, of US, also Western politicians, kind of stating the same. Yeah? So yep. the absolute geopolitical nightmare is the combination of German know-how and, and money yeah, with Russian resources and labor. Right? And yeah. this, this is a long-standing policy. Yeah, I mean, George Friedman, he was, he was doing a talk at, on the, in Chicago, Council of Foreign Affairs or something. Uh, it can be found on the internet. George Friedman, uh, he was, he was uh, the director Stratfor. of Stratfor. Yeah. And he said it very clearly. He said, you know, Reagan supported the Iranians um, and he supported uh, the Iraqis. Uh, yeah. you know, Iran he Contra. Both, yeah, and he support, he, 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 they supported both sides and they killed each other. And he said that was a brilliant idea. He says the British never, you know, uh, controlled India. They, they just had different groups in India, different kings and had them fight each other. So this is really divide um, and conquer. And, and he says, Friedman says very clearly, the US could not you know, come with troops across the Atlantic and then conquer all of Europe or conquer all of Eurasia because they would be outnumbered. So the only thing that they can do is basically uh, you know, make sure that the Russians and the Germans are fighting in each other, that North Vietnam and South Vietnam are fighting each other, that the Japanese and the, the, the Chinese are fighting each other, um, so, or that Iran and Israel are fighting each other. You can, you can f if you look at it from a distance, uh, you can always you know, create tension between groups that are there. And the tensions between Ukraine and Russia obviously weakened Russia, okay? And the Americans didn't, didn't have to send many soldiers. No, officially, they didn't send any. I mean, they sent special forces, we know that. But officially, no American soldier fought in, in Ukraine. And, and that's, a, that's the strategy that we have to think about here in Europe because it's not being discussed. It's not being discussed. And, but and it's openly yeah. discussed in the US. Yeah, I yeah. have a statement here from a retired General Keith Kellogg. Yeah, he was an ex-advisor to Mike Pence. Yeah? Yeah. I think it's just a couple of uh, days old. Yeah? And he says, Senator, I believe if you can defeat a strategic adversary not using any US troops, you're at the acme of professionalism because letting the Ukrainians defeat that, it takes, an op it takes a strategic adversary off the table, and then we can focus where we should be focusing against our primary adversary, which is China at this time. We can focus on our primary ad adversary, which is China. So it's already a roadmap. Yeah, yeah so but you know what, Thomas? I think it's not working because if, he not, if this guy, American strategist, or, or, or if, if they think it's, it's very clever, I mean, if the acme of professionalism yeah. is like, this is a very, very clever idea. Yeah. Because they say, we'll fight to the last Ukrainian, and they laugh about it. Okay, they say, we just sent them weapons, yeah. they can do the killing of the Russians. Okay, a lot of Ukrainians get killed on the way, but we don't care. So they think it's a clever idea. I don't think it's clever at all, because what really happened is that Russia has now gone very closely together with China. And many people think, oh, it has always been like that. It's yeah. not been like that. It's very important to see that Russia traditionally has tried um, to have strong relationships with Berlin and not with Beijing, okay? But now, um, with the Ukrainian war, and actually it all already started before the Ukrainian war, I mean, the Russians and the Chinese, they both said, okay, we can do a no-fly zone over Libya in 2011. And the British and the French and the Americans said, thank you very much. I mean, that was in the UN Security Council. And they took this Security Council resolution and instead of just establishing a no-fly zone, which basically means uh, you control the air and Gaddafi cannot fly around, um, uh, they, they went in and bombed the country and armed the resistance, and the resistance killed Gaddafi. So it was a total war with the regime change, and, and Putin and, and the Chinese were looking at it, and they were going, Jesus Christ, what did they do? I mean, w we were really deceived at the United Nations. And that was in 2011, and that made already um, uh, Moscow and Beijing moving closer together. And then 2014, the uh, Obama uh, administration overthrew the government in Kiev, and that again triggered, um, triggered the Russians very much. And then the, um, 
the embargo, it was very much the embargo against Russia and the confiscation of Russian money in the US and in Europe. It's, it's 300 billion, okay? It's a lot of and money. And from Afghanistan. Yeah, and, Afghanistan. and it was confiscated. Yeah. yeah. And that has now led to a very solid interaction within the BRIC countries. Yeah. So to come back on that guy who said, this is very intelligent. No, what you basically do, you create a much stronger alliance among your adversary. And it's not very clever to create a very strong alliance among your adversaries because, I mean, Russia is the biggest country as far as size is concerned. And, and China has 1.4 uh, million, million people, and a billion people. I mean, I mean, it is not very, very clever to have them move closer together, but that's what happened. Yeah. And since you spoke about parallels, yeah, there are some parallels between, also, uh, f first of all, Kiev, yeah, you, you said Kiev, Putsch, and so, yeah. I think yeah. you have to elaborate a little bit for people who don't know. We know Victoria Nuland, we know this uh, telephone call, fuck the you, sorry. Fuck the call, yeah. Yeah. Please. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's on, on chapter 279. Yeah. The USA coup d'etat in Ukraine, 2014. I, I, I'm saying, okay, Ukraine. They had a, a president, his name was Yanukovych. He was elected in 2010. Democratically. Democratically. And he yeah. left in 2014 and he was not replaced through an election, but through a coup d'etat. And that's one of the things here in Switzerland, the media doesn't want to talk about. And that's one of the things in Germany and Austria. I mean, I just know the German speaking world, as I said, I know that world very well. They just don't want to speak about it. So when I give public talks, I'm going to give a talk in, in Berlin in a, in a week. Um, and uh, when I give public talks, you know, the media is really attacking me. I mean, not the mainstream media. They say, oh, you know, don't listen to this guy. I mean, he's saying that the U.S. overthrew the government in Kiev. That's not true. And I'm always going, come on, don't kill the messenger. It's not my mistake. I didn't overthrow the government. I'm just the historian who's taking the facts and bringing it out to the public. I mean, that's the job that, that the German television should do, but they don't do it. So back to the story. Um, at that time, Victoria Nuland was was already um, uh, in 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 the, in the foreign ministry, in the U.S. foreign ministry, and the and secretary she, of state. Yeah. And the secretary of state. So uh, you have you have Obama as president, you have Joe Biden, Joe Biden, the acting president now, mm -hmm. who was then vice president. Um, so Joe Biden was totally directly involved in this coup d'état, and uh, he now goes like, "Oh no, I can't remember," and. Then you have John Kerry, um, Secretary of State, and under uh, John Kerry, you have Victoria Newland. And she is at the, she, she, she says, we invested five billion into, uh, you know, into Ukraine. She says, like, you know, we invested it to promote democracy. But what she basically may, means is we invested it in people um, who, who, who represented our interests. You know, you can, you can go into Ukraine if you have a lot of money and you can say, um, are you on our side? And then you had protests in Kiev. Kiev is the capital of Ukraine. And in Kiev, you have a wonderful uh, square, which is called the Maidan. So all these protesters, they were gathering there. And they were saying, the Yanukovych government, you know, they should step down. It's a bad government. And, you know, Thomas, granted, some of those protesters, they were just genuinely unhappy, you know, with their government. And as, as I said, with referring to Israel, it's totally okay to protest against your government because in many cases there is good reason to do so. Um, but these protests, then in 2013 they were going on, they then escalated in 2014 with the demonstrator attacking the police. I mean, that, that, that's something that is way beyond democratic protest. They really hit the police with stones and, and, and pepper spray in the, in the eyes and everything and chains and everything. And, and it was not... It was not your no normal demonstration. It was becoming some sort of a warfare zone. Um, and then on 20 sep uh, February 2014, we have um, snipers who from buildings surrounding that square were shooting both policemen and demonstrator, and then they withdraw. And that is a very, very dangerous tactic because it confuses everybody. The demonstrators... You know, they see their comrades going down, dead, 
And they think that must have been the police because, you know, we're fighting the police day after day. And the police, um, the Berkut, um, that's a, a part of the Ukrainian police, they think it must have been the demonstrators because they were, you know, being, you know, in, in, in confrontation with the demonstrators for a long time. And both groups don't understand that it's this third group, the sniper group, which came in and then moved out. And so you have the first dead people, 50 or 100 dead, not many, but that is the beginning of Ukrainian war. And that's, that's what I always say, and that's the same now with Hamas and Israel. You have to look at the first day. You have to look at the first day. It's very important to be very, very careful. And then after that, after that shooting, you really have um, Yanukovych, the elected uh, president, fleeing the country because he sees, okay, it's all on fire. And, and Oliver Stone, uh, he, he did an excellent documentary, Ukraine on Fire. Um, he, he, he's a well-known filmmaker, but, but many people don't want to talk about it. But that's where, the, where, that's where the war in Ukraine started. It didn't start with the Russian invasion on 24 February 22. It started eight years before that. And people like Jeffrey Sachs or John Mersheimer or Noam Chomsky, uh, they know that. Or Benjamin Abelov, they know that and they say that. Or Scott Ritter or Sarah Wagenknecht. So, so there's a few people who know that and who say that publicly. And uh, obviously they get, um, they get called all sorts of names. <laughs> mm. But uh, I, interviewed. I, I just insist, we have, we've, we've seen a coup d'etat in Ukraine mm -hmm. and afterwards we have a civil war and then we have the Russian invasion. That's the historical sequence of events. Mm. I, interviewed, I interviewed Ivan Kachanovsky. He wrote his PhD ah. on the Maidan uh, massacre. Yeah? He's the he man. Sent me, he's the man. He sent me some material. Yeah? He also brought to light now that in the Canadian uh, uh, parliament they gave a standing ovation to a former to an actually former Nazi yeah that was him who who brought this to light yeah but, yeah, he, but he let me let me say one word about Ivan Kotkanovsky he uh, analyzed radio communication exactly. on the 20 February 2014 yeah. so he has direct evidence and he speaks the languages yeah. he's I, I I mean I don't speak Ukrainian I don't speak Russian I can't you know even if I had the data uh, of the radio communication obviously that was in Russian or it was in Ukrainian um, I don't speak either of these languages but Ivan Kotkanovsky uh, he's, he's at the Cana Canadian is he in Toronto where is he based I think in I think in, Can in Canada yeah. yeah I don't know which city but he's in Canada yeah. and he speaks the languages and he has published on the topic so if anybody wants to know more about the uh, coup d'etat on the 20 February 2014 Kotkanovsky is the man to read. Yeah, I, I will put a link in the in the description. He's actually, yeah, I think, teaching at, at the university, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe. Yeah, I think in Toronto. Yeah, but I'm yeah. not sure. I've never yeah. I've never met him, but I, I read yeah. his stuff and it's just very good. Yeah, but as a segue, you just said that the war started in 2014. Yeah, yep. well, we could argue actually the root causes are earlier than that. At least in 2008 in in Bucharest, right? That's when right. Bush said when Bush said we gonna put uh, Gregoria and 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 uh, Ukraine into into NATO, yep. please. Yeah, I mean that was a big 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 mistake. It has to be said that you know the uh, enlargement of NATO started in 99 when they took in uh, Poland. Um, um, Hungary, Czech Republic, and and that was that was already a mistake. That was a mistake mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, we have to keep, go one step back. In 1989, the German war was falling, and um, then when Germany was reunited, you had two parts. You had uh, East Germany and West Germany. I know that you know it, Thomas, but just trying to explain yeah, yeah. it to, to people who are listening. And um, uh, so, the, so West Germany was a part of NATO. And in East Germany, you had uh, Soviet troops, 500,000, half a million troops, a lot of troops. And then Gorbachev, who then, you know, who was the last president of the Soviet Union, because afterwards the Soviet Union collapsed. So he was the last man standing there. Um, he was talking to German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. And then uh, Kohl and, and, uh, and Gorbachev became friends. I mean, they, they trusted each other. And then Kohl, the German, uh, Chancellor asked Gorbachev, can you withdraw your 500,000 troops? I mean, think about that. And Gorbachev said, yeah. And he took them out of Eastern Germany. And that was, you know, that was the reason why Germany could, you, 
unite. There was no way they could unite with American troops on one side and Soviet troops on the other side. So mm. the Soviets withdrew. And the American state, okay, to this day when we speak, there's 38,000 American troops in Germany. And so Germany was then as a whole put into NATO. I mean, the West was already NATO and the East was the new bit which they added. So that, that was okay because that was the deal with the Russians. But the promise at that time, and that was in February 1990, of US uh, Secretary of State James Baker to Gorbachev was NATO will not move one inch to the East. And they broke that promise in 99, and that was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton took Poland into NATO. I mean, the Polish wanted, but, you know, the U.S. should have said, sorry, we can't take you. The club is closed. <laughs> uh, we, we made this promise to Russia. Mm -hmm. And then in 2004, as you rightly said, you know, NATO further expanded with Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia and Slovenia. So all these countries coming in and the Russians see, OK, NATO is moving closer to our borders. And then in 2008, as you pointed out, uh, Bush, uh, President Bush, who, who was, you know, just doing his last year, he came in power into 2001. After eight years, he was going. And 2008 was his last year. And uh, so Bush um, went to, to Romania, went to Bucharest, which is the capital of Romania. And there was a NATO summit. And yeah, it's, as you say, it's there he invited Ukraine and Georgia to become member states of NATO. I mean, that was crazy. And Bill Burns, who is today the, uh, the director of the CIA, CIA. The DCA, he at the time was a uh, uh, U.S. Ambassador. ambassador to Russia. Yeah. And he said, you know, this is going to lead to civil war. You, you shouldn't do that. And it, this went up to the Secretary of State, who was Condoleezza Rice at the time. So Bill Burns, you know, as an ambassador, you don't really tell the Secretary of State what to do. And you don't really tell the president what to do. So I give credit to Bill Burns. I mean, he's the same guy who seems to have done the planning for uh, taking out Nord Stream. But Bill Burns had the courage, at least in 2008, to say, uh, no, we, 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 we shouldn't invite Ukraine to become a NATO member. But, but uh, and actually, at the time, Angela Merkel was the German chancellor. She was against it, and the, and the, and the French were against it. Um, but the U.S. said, well, who cares what Germany and, and France say? And Bush just went ahead and invited Ukraine. And Putin at the time was also present at that, at that uh, summit. And he said, uh, don't do that. You know, this is, this, this is not acceptable from a Russian perspective. So, yeah, you're right. It, the, 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 the tipping point was 2014, the coup d'etat. But uh, uh, the downhill slope, <laughs> if you want, mm. started in 2008, where, where things went awfully wrong. And uh, I think it was just the American neocons who, who pushed it. Yeah, maybe a, a couple of things, if I may. Yeah? So I grew up with this glorified image from America, the heroes always. Yeah? Mm. I grew up believing that America won the Second World War. Now, mm. if you look at the numbers, 400. 30, 40,000 Americans died in the Second World War. Mm. Soldiers in yep. Russia, s between seven, uh, 35 and 70, sorry, between 35 and 37 million people, not only soldiers, but also people died. Yeah, I thought 27 million, but I'm not sure we can, 27 I, million, but okay, that, let's say close to 30 million. Yeah, something like that. And they paid a heavy, so they paid a heavy price and they gave up East Germany for nothing. Yeah, the soldiers, those five hundred thousand that, that that you just mentioned, they went somewhere in a gulag. Uh, Russia was not prepared to take them in. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. So without a single shot fired, people don't understand what Russia actually gave up strategically. Yeah, yeah. and then it said, "Well, we kind of never promised it." Yeah. Now I saw. I even know the folder in the in the Washington University's um, archive where the declassified documents are, which clearly state what was promised to Gorbachev. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And today, and this coming back to you, is a question. Yeah? There are many people who say, many intelligent people that I'm talking with about this topic are telling me this has nothing to do with NATO. I mean, Russia invading, Russia invading uh, Ukraine. And the tip, the tip of the iceberg is the former Finnish uh, premier, I believe, Alexander Stab, who said... And I 
quote exactly, NATO has never attacked another country. Yeah. But they have I'm, no idea. I mean, come on. Liz. If, if you say something like that, it's like if you say Paris is the capital of Italy. <laughs> I almost fell off my chair when I heard this. Yeah. It's a former Finnish prime minister on his YouTube channel broadcasts this kind of information. Yeah. Last one, Minsk. Yeah. I, I haven't seen that, you know. I, haven't I, send, seen I, I send it to you. I, I send true, it to you. I'm just saying it's just beyond. I mean, this shows you we're, in, we're living in an age of confusion. We're living in an age of confusion. I mean, so much information, you know, coming in on people that people get totally confused. And the fact, just to get this straight, in 99... That was the 50th anniversary of NATO. Clinton bombed Serbia. So NATO bombed another country. When? In 99. Which country? Serbia. And secondly, it was an operation without a mandate of the UN Security Council. So it was clearly illegal, like the Russian invasion into Ukraine. It's also clearly illegal because you can't invade another country if you don't have a mandate of the UN Security Council. The bombing of Iraq in 2003 by Bush and Blair clearly illegal. So this Finnish, what is it, prime minister? He has just no clue. Or, Alexander or Stubb. Alexander Stubb, former he Finnish no prime minister. He has no clue or he, he didn't study history or he, I, I mean, there's two possibilities. One is, and I, I give him the credit that he just doesn't know. The other thing is he knows and he lies. That's worse. But I don't know. I don't know the guy. Talking about lying or misdirection. Yeah. So Minsk agreements. Yeah, we had the Minsk two Minsk agreements, yeah. and then uh, Hollande and Merkel stated what? Please. Well, just bring people back to the coup d'état in 2014. I, I maybe take the story from there. After the coup d'état, the newly installed government, that was not Zelensky at the time. Zelensky only came in 2019, but the newly the new government then attacked the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine. That's the problem. So they attacked the Donbass and the Krim split off, you know, so Ukraine got smaller. And then a um, CIA director flew into uh, Ukraine and, and advised the government and the U.S. Special Forces flew in and trained the Ukrainian army. But the Ukrainian army was rather weak at the time. So a deal was struck uh, when the civil war broke out um, that, you know, uh, Kiev should stop killing its own population in the east, in the Donbass region, um, that they should have a ceasefire. And Angela Merkel was then Chancellor of Germany, and uh, Hollande was the president of France, and Putin, president of, of Russia at the time, they were um, the guarant they were sort of given a job to guarantee that this Minsk agreement would be, you know, would be implemented. But the government in Kiev, so they just didn't do it. They continued to bomb their own population between 2014 and 2022. And in the year 2090, 2020 and 2021, for three years before the Russian invasion, Zelensky uh, was responsible for that. So Zelensky is not, you know, a force for, for peace, as he's always represented here. I mean, Zelensky spoke to the Swiss parliament recently and he had a standing ovation. I'm going like, Jesus Christ, he killed his own people in his own country. But, you know, that, that, that shows you the Swiss government, I mean, uh, the Swiss parliament is also not very well informed. But what I wanted to point out is that um, the Kiev peace deal was a good idea because it said, let's have a ceasefire first. Don't kill each other. After the ceasefire, the second idea is also always the same, like in North Korea. Withdraw the troops, both sides, and have a zone which is demilitarized, you know, between the Donbass, which is in the east of Ukraine, you know, uh, and let's have a zone which is de demilitarized. That would have been a good idea. But Angela Merkel and Hollande uh, later admitted that it was never the idea to, to really do that, but they said they needed the time to make the Ukrainian army stronger. And then Putin, when he heard that, he said, I never thought, you know, that they were deceiving me like that. And this is something which, which in the Russian press is being 
discussed. But in the German press, it's not being discussed much. Most people don't even know uh, that the Minsk deal would have been a good deal for Ukraine. Um, and most people think the whole problem started with the Russian invasion of February 24 in 2022. And it's not true. So they don't see the entire um, history. Mm. Coming back to what we said at the very beginning, you know, silencing voices. So I would like to spend a couple of minutes on your example, mm. because I'm not entirely sure. I, I heard that they were attempting to take your doctor title away. I'm not sure if they succeeded. No, no, that no. didn't work. I, I did my PhD in 2001. In September 2001, exactly the, the month when we had 9-11, and I was working on Operation Gladio and uh, CIA terrorism in Western Europe. So uh, yeah. I was Maybe working actually... on strategy of tension and no, no, they never, they never took my PhD away and uh, they never attempted to do that. But what they did is that uh, I, was, I was working at the ETH, which is, in, uh, which is a reputable re uh, uh, university in Switzerland. We have 12 universities in Switzerland. We have Basel, we have Zurich, we have Bern, we have Lausanne, we have, well, we have a few. Um, and uh, uh, when I questioned 9-11, I came under heavy, heavy pressure. And that's why I have my own institute now outside of, my, of, of university, my independent institute. I, I do public talks, I sell my books and I have an online community where people you know, can pay a membership and then they are in the community and, and we do geostrategic analysis. And, and that is, is in German, I have to say. But I have it open. It's called Swiss Institute for Peace and Energy Research. And this is what I wanted to ask you. You have an English name, but it's a German website. <laughs> It's true, yeah. I thought yeah. I'd give it an English name. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure whether it was a good idea, but I mean, nobody remembers the name of my institute anyway. They, they just know Daniele Ganzo uh, yeah. is a Swiss historian. And, and I, I want to point out that if you are at university in Switzerland and you question 9-11, you know, I said, you know, World Trade Center 7 was brought down through controlled demolition. We were lied to on 9-11 which means the whole war in Afghanistan, which started on 7 October 2001, lasted for 20 years with direct NATO involvement. I, I wonder why the Finnish parliamentarian didn't get, get realized that one, if he missed the Serbia war. But anyway, I, if, if you, if you put, pose these, these, these questions, and I have it in this book, my, there's a chapter on 9-11 as well. If you, if you, go, if you go so deep, into the rabbit hole, you, you, you have a very, very hard time to survive at a, at a Swiss university. Yeah. I know that from, as an insider, and, and it's the same for Germany. I mean, check the, the history professors in Germany, um, you know, there are a few, uh, or check the professors for, for political science in Germany uh, or Switzerland, and then check what they say on 9-11. And you will find that all who are still in office say, Whatever President Bush said um, is the absolute truth. I mean, it was Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. And who dares to question this um, has to leave university because he's a crazy conspiracy theorist. So it's very much, um, you know, like the church in the, in, in the Middle Ages. It's, it's like uh, who dares to question that the, that the, the, the earth is in the center and, and the sun moves around the earth he's just a crazy guy and he has to leave it's 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 what we call an ideological position you were not even allowed and we're now in the year 2023 we're not even allowed at german universities at swiss universities or at austrian universities to publicly talk about the question whether we were lied to on 9-11 and it's Come on, it's 20, 23 years ago, 22 years ago. Crazy. I didn't plan, I didn't plan to go into, to venture into 9-11, but since you mentioned it, I interviewed Richard Gale, and he was actually the one who gave me your phone number and uh, your email address, so I'm very yeah, grateful. Yeah, I met him in Zurich, yeah, I met him in Zurich. Yes, yes, yes. The one, the one thing, talking about 9-11, what stuck for me out, is the free fall, yeah. I mean, there's evidence from the third building. People have no clue there was a third building, two airplanes. Well, first of all, there was a plane who didn't reach the target. The plane that the Absolutely. passengers apparently, yeah, 
And if we assume that, I mean, you cannot just pull a building, but like uh, Rudy Giuliani said, we, we had to pull the building, the third building. Building It takes it a month. Is, of it was, no, it was Larry Silverstein. It was not Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani was the mayor of New yeah. York. He said we had to pull the building. He said that? Yeah. But he Larry said Silverstein that. also yes. said it. He was also said it. After, Larry but Silverstein. at the day, at the day, walking, I saw the interview, walking oh, okay. through the dust, he said we had to pull the building. And yeah. did, he, did Giuliani said that on World Trade Center 7? On World Trade Center 7, yes, we had to pull the building. Yeah. No, that but means you're totally right, you need preparation. Yeah. So it's it, so, and then you have this building coming down in partially in free fall, yeah, yeah, like and that. in its in in its own fingerprint, yeah. So that was very very impressive. But if you talk to people, coming back to the, this plane who who was brought down, then you have a building which is fully armed. So what are you gonna do? You have to invent the reason, like the office fire, a office fire collapsing a how, 50, 50 stories? I don't know exactly, yeah. Yeah, but it, this is an symmetrically to human intelligence. <laughs> if you say an office fire destroyed World Trade Center 7, that was the explanation of NIST, the yeah. National Institute for Science and Technology. And it was broadcasted 20 minutes prior to BBC. actually happening. That was BBC. I mean, you know, let's bring in people who don't know the story. Yeah. Um, September 11, 2001 um, was the biggest terrorist attack in the United States with 3,000 people killed. Okay, that was bigger than now Hamas attacking Israel with 1,000, 1,300 killed. 9-11 was bigger. It was bigger than Lockerbie. Uh, it was bigger than Bologna, which before that were big terrorist attacks. Now, as a historian, of, of course, I have to look at big terrorist attacks and because they trigger large events. And 9-11, um, most people think plane, plane, building, building. They just have the World Trade Centers in their, in their head, World Trade Center 1, World Trade Center 2. But besides um, World Trade Center 1 and 2, there was a third building which is called World Trade Center 7. And as you correctly said, Thomas, World Trade Center 7 was never hit by a plane. And it collapsed in the afternoon so the Twin Towers were down before noon, before 12 o'clock, but that building was still standing. And BBC reported at 5 o'clock that World Trade Center 7 had also collapsed. The problem was that it didn't collapse then, it collapsed at 5.20, 20 minutes later. So we're, we're really puzzled here. We're getting the story on BBC, the journalist speaking was Jane Stanley. And she was doing some live reporting and she was saying, OK, World Strength 7 has also collapsed, the, the Salomon Brothers building, as it's called. And you see behind her, World Trade Center 7 is still standing. And the BBC took seven years to apologize. In 2008, Jane Stanley came forward and said, OK, sorry, that's a mistake. And then Richard Porter was the head of BBC World News. He said, uh, we got this information from Reuters, but then you go into that you know, big question, are we being sold a story which was there already? And they just had a mistake, you know, they had a mistake. They reported the collapse of World Trade Center 7 too early. So this is very, very puzzling. And I, I, I don't trust the BBC anymore uh, because of that reporting. But the problem is people don't even know that World Trade Center 7 fell. But Richard Gage and others have then dug deep. Uh, David Ray Griffin is one of the guys who was really working on this. So there's American US, US people who worked on this. Um, and, and I'm just you know, profiting from their knowledge and their work. And they put up uh, the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. And then they had a professor in Alaska. His name is Leroy Halsey to look at World Trade Center 7. And he said, that building was not destroyed by fire. He didn't say it was controlled demolition, but you only have two options, fire or controlled demolition. So he said, it's not fire. So everybody has to think for themselves uh, that it obviously was controlled demolition. And if, if you are at that point, you see the free fall, then you realize that also the war in Afghanistan was based on lies. Pre-planned, yeah. Maybe just a little bit of context because I did mention it. So Richard Gage is the founder of uh, engineers and architects uh, for 9-11. Those are two, more than 2,000 engineers and architects, Americans, yeah. who based on their professional knowledge, 
dispute the the mainstream narrative of of 9/11 yeah i also interviewed eric lawyer i have not published it yet he's the founder of firefighters for 9/11 incredible stories because these guys were there they talk about lava streams of metal down there yeah and explosions and explosions multiple explosions yeah i i've i've interviews where you actually hear those explosions while the yeah. firefighters are talking yeah yeah and this is i mean you know thomas this is evidence that people here in switzerland have never heard they if they if they go into the subject into the subject of 9/11 they can find it you know it's not that we don't have internet i mean you can put in world trade center 7 or you can put it 9/11 and explosions and within like an hour or two you can see videos and videos and videos on that but i'm talking about mainstream i'm i'm talking about the leading newspaper here in switzerland is the neue zürcher zeitung and it said that that i like the new york times in in in, in the us or or like uh, the FAZ in in Germany and these mainstream outlets they still to this very day say it was Osama bin Laden they they just say bush said the, the truth and if you go like but how how did they bring world trade center 7 down that was that was controlled demolition did Osama bin Laden plant the explosives i mean you've got to be kidding then they go oh gee we don't want to talk about it first and then you insist and say but i want to talk about it then they say and second world trade center 7 fell because of a fire and i know this because the national institute for standards and technology said so that i go low oh, yeah but that's a lie okay the nist lied and why don't you check for yourself why don't you look at the data because then you would realize that this is a lie but then uh, mainstream swiss television which is called SRF Schweizer Radio und Fernsehen they invited me once for a debate we have these public debates it's called Arena and that was in 2017 and they really just you know attacked me because i i said we were lied to on 911 so my personal experience really is i'm completely you know clear on that fact world trade center 7 was brought down with controlled demolition but to talk about it it seems like an easy thing to do no if you go into a mainstream television channel i don't know how it is in in holland but it is in, even in the us i mean tucker carlson a uh, us journalist uh, mm -hmm. who, who previously worked on fox news but now is 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 i think he's now on twitter is he and yep. he has much yep. more people listening to him there yeah he said talking about 911 or world trade center 7 is almost impossible so we have the same phenomenon in the west as in switzerland and in germany and i bet it's the same in many in other the countries. western world which is only west, like 16 16 percent of the world population we are in yeah. this media bubble where yeah. it, the information is presented to us like the whole world is sharing that view i'm yeah. watching indian news yeah oh, they to get they the... don't believe the story do they <laughs> no yeah um, Daniele, I have overstayed my welcome, but I would like to discuss one more topic, if it's okay with you, because it's your core topic. And if I'm not mistaken, you wrote your PhD about it. It's, it's the Gladio story. Would you want to elaborate still? Yeah, let's, let's do a little longer. Um, uh, just finish with Gladio. I mean, the Gladio story is, is, is this one. Uh, NATO secret armies. I, I, I also have the English translation. Wait, me. Uh, where is it? I have it down there somewhere. Can't grab it right now. I will put a link in the description. Put a link. It's, it's on my shelf. Yeah. Um, I did my PhD on this. Uh, so I put four years of research into the topic and it, 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 it basically started. I was at the MIT visiting Norm Chomsky and he said, why, uh, why don't you research Gladio? And I was going, Gladio? And, and he says, well, you do speak Italian, do you? And I said, yes, because I was, uh, I was born in, in Lugano, which is the uh, Italian speaking part of Switzerland. And he said, you know, we need somebody who speaks Italian because most of the data is in Italian and you speak English, you speak Italian, you speak French and German, so you'd be a good guy to do this. And I said, well, thanks, that's an interesting topic. I talked to my professors at Basel University because if you do a, a, a PhD in history, you first have to convince your professor that this is something which you can do. 
So I had Georg Kreis uh, uh, at Basel University and Yussi Hanni Maki at the LSE in London, London School of Economics and Political Science. And they both said, yeah, you can do it. Uh, it's a complicated subject, but you know, try, try to find out as much as you can. So I came up with this book. And uh, in the end, I said, nature during the Cold War. So the Cold War is from 1947 or 1945, if you want, at the end of the uh, Second World War to 1990. Uh, that's the end of the Cold War, or 91, if you want, the fall of the Soviet Union. And during the Cold War, I'm talking about that time, you had the competition between Washington and Moscow, and Europe was divided. Part of it was NATO countries, so France and, 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 and Italy and Spain and Great Britain, they were all in NATO countries, whereas uh, Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria, they were allied with the Soviet Union. Um, you know, I'm just bringing this up so people have the context. I know that you know that, Thomas, but I'm just bringing it up for context. And so in the Western Europe world, NATO was dominant, but they had a problem. In Italy, for instance, the Communist Party was very strong. And then NATO feared if Italy, which is a NATO country, has such a strong Communist Party, if that Communist Party at one point has a Communist defense minister in the government, then all the secrets of NATO would go to Moscow because the Italian Communist um, uh, Defense Minister, there was never an Italian Communist Defense Minister for God's sake, but NATO planners were going like, that would be a nightmare, so we can't have that. So they had a challenge and what they did is they set up NATO secret armies in all countries of Western Europe. They even had a secret army in Switzerland, although Switzerland was not part of NATO. In Switzerland it was called P26. In, in uh, Germany it was just called Stay Behind, which is the general, general name. Um, in uh, Italy it was called Gladio, like sword, gladiator. Some people know the film uh, Gladiator. So that's just a sword, uh, short sword. And they said the CIA and the MI6 put up this army, and that, that you know that's for sure. There's no debate about it. Uh, uh, William Colby, who, who, who was the director of the CIA in the 70s, he confirmed it, and uh, the European Parliament made an investigation, and the Italian Parliament made an investigation. And they all confirmed it, so that's for sure. CIA and MI6 set up these secret armies. They were meant to be top secret, but then Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti in 1990 blew the whistle, and he said, we have a secret army here in Italy. And everybody was like, what is he talking about? And, and uh, he said, yeah, it was set up by uh, the CIA and the MI6 and coordinated by NATO. And everyone was like, that's crazy, it can't be. But he was the prime minister of Italy. So you could not say, you are a conspiracy nut. So it was not possible to say that. And then obviously other countries um, uh, in NATO asked, is this true? And then the supreme allied commander of NATO you know, took together all the NATO ambassadors in Brussels and said, yes, it's true what Andriotti says, but we're not going to comment on it. You know, this is top, top secret. Manfred Wörner at the time, a German, was the secretary general. So it was, it was this huge scandal within NATO in the year 1990. You had one uh, press spokesman coming forward. Yes, yes, we had these secret armies. And on the next day, another NATO spokesperson came forward. Oh, what we said yesterday is not true. And we, we're very sorry. We, can't, we cannot make any comments. Um, so that was the framework. And I thought, that's really interesting. I want to know more about it. And then I read books of former commanders of these NATO secret armies, like uh, General Inzerilli, uh, um, and they were, they were Italians, and they wrote books about their time when they were commanders of these secret structures. And they were, wrote these books in, in Italian, and, and, I, and I do speak Italian, so I, I, I could read these books. And, and the, 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 the most delicate issue is, these secret armies put up arms caches. They had explosives in these uh, arms deposits. They had communication equipment. They had guns. They had uh, uh, ammunition. Uh, they even had gold uh, in these caches. And they said, we use these arms caches that if there is a Soviet invasion of Western Europe, uh, we're ready to fight as a guerrilla network. So they said, this secret army will only become operative in case of a Soviet invasion. Obviously, there was never a Soviet invasion of Western Europe in the Cold War. So, if anything, 
um, uh, you know, according to the textbook, Gladio should have not been operative at all. But now we have the problem that in different countries, in Belgium and in Italy, uh, we had terrorist attacks in France as well. In, in Greece and in Turkey, we had coup d'etats. And now the question is, were these secret armies, these Gladio armies, linked to these coup d'etats in Greece in 1967 or in Turkey in 1980? Uh, and were they linked to the terrorist attacks in Bologna or in Peteano in Italy in 72 or in the Brabant massacres in Belgium? And that is, uh, frankly speaking, such a delicate issue. It is really delicate because we're speaking about CIA terrorism in Europe. And so I was, I was researching this for many, many years, and I came to the point where I said, okay, I can prove on the one hand, we have these secret armies. On the other, and you know, in Germany, they had right-wing extremists in these secret armies, just to make sure that they were anti-communists. On the other hand, we have, we have the terrorist attacks and we have the coup d'etat, you know, that's official knowledge. And now, the link, I take the pencil for the link. The link is very fragile. To, to really prove that the CIA was responsible for these terrorist attacks in Europe and that they used the stay behind networks, that is challenging, to say the least. Challenging. I, I, I went to tons of data and the, the best, the best um, analysis that I can give you now is that the CIA in Italy linked up with right-wing groups like Ordine Nuovo, and then Ordine Nuovo carried out these ter terrorist attacks. So it was all linked through NATO, through right-wing extremists, and they used some of the explosive from these secret uh, arms uh, caches. But that was top, top secret. And they still talk about it in, in Italy, uh, and they call it terzo livello, third level, because they could convict, uh, they had then, you know, uh, people were killed and then they had judges investigating it and they could find out that Ordine Nuovo was involved. So that's the, the right-wing terrorist. And on the stats primi primero livello, first level, they could also find out that the Italian Secret Service was involved. That's second level, okay? But to prove that the US and NATO and the, the British, MI6 and CIA were involved, that's what we call the third level, terzo livello. And on, the, on terzo livello, still to this very day, we're, we're, we're making very, very slow progress only. It's a huge story. But if, you know, if even Nord Stream, which is quite obvious, uh, cannot be talked about, Gladio is even more difficult. So, so in a nutshell. Everybody else can read the book. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's worth, mo worth mentioning that most of the heads of state were not aware. Yeah, right? the, the, and the parliamentarians and the professors and the journalists, most had no clue. Yeah, it was really top secret. Yeah, and there was a link to crime. So I just wanted to ask very briefly. So talking in this context about Olaf Palme or Herrenhausen, yeah. 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 I mean, especially Herrenhausen, yeah, he, yeah. They, blew, they blew him up with his uh, armed limousine that was a professional hit. They put the cable under the asphalt of the street and nobody saw it, yeah. Who, who and does... Aldo Moro, Aldo Moro in Italy, uh, also you know, it, it's, it's, it's probably too simple to say that all these evil acts are blamed, can be blamed on Gladio. That's too simple. But it would also be foolish to assume that the US had no way to secretly carry out operations in Europe. Because we know that the US were operative in Latin America. Okay, we know that. Uh, for instance, uh, in Chile, they overthrew Allende and they attacked uh, Schneider, General Schneider, yeah. who was really a strong yeah. supporter of Allende. They attacked him by arming um, radical groups in Chile. And I say, well, in Europe, we go like, okay, they did this in Latin America and, you know, they supported Pinochet and Pinochet tortured people, whatever. Too bad for Latin America. That's, you know, that's what usually Europeans think. And they go like, oh, the CIA overthrew Mossadegh in Iran. Too bad for people in Iran. 
uh, and then they go like, oh, the CIA overthrew Lumumba uh, to, together with the Belgian Secret Service in Congo, Congo. and killed him uh, in the early 60s. And it's like, okay, too bad for the Congo. But it was always this thinking that they wouldn't do it in Europe because we're in the same NATO, that's a military alliance, and you know there would be no attacks but within NATO. But now with the North Stream terrorist attack, which claimed no you know, human lives, uh, so I think it's very easy to research a tele, uh, a terrorist attacks where you have no human casualties. The, the level that, I, that we are talking about with, uh, with Herrhaus and with uh, Olaf Palme, who was, who, who was trying to set up um, uh, a neutral zone in, in, in the Scandinavian countries, mm. um, it is much more difficult it is much more difficult to talk about potential acts of CIA terrorism in Europe. To, to most, to most uh, scholars and journalists, it's like, that can't be. It's impossible, so let's not talk about it. Um, I'm different. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these guys who said, yes, it can be. Why not? I mean, you know, if it happened in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, why not in Europe? And secondly, uh, I said, there is data, there is data. Gladio is the key word. And uh, then going from there, everybody has to make up his own mind. But it's, it's very, 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 very complicated. Mm. I have one last question. I know as a historian, last you look question. back. Last, last question. question. We have to I know as a historian, you look back. Yeah, but I'm asking you about the future because you brought up BRICS. Yeah? Yeah. Where, where is this going for, for America? The de-dollarization that's everywhere going on. Yeah? If the petrodollar no longer is the reserve, the world reserve currency. I mean, for me, that's the lifeblood. That's the, uh, without it, America cannot, cannot exist. Most people don't even know what is the petrodollar in a, in a real sense. Yeah? So if BRICS succeeds, which it looks like it, right? It's gonna grow. Yeah. So where's America? Where's America? And by implication, where are we, the West, going with America? Um, I think America is now, uh, you know, ha has 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 passed the moment of its greatest power. I'm I'm saying uh, between 45. I mean, in 45, they threw the atomic bomb on Japan, two atomic bombs, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, and that was the moment where they had. A lot of power you know they were the only country with the atomic bomb um, and they had they were the country who was on the winning side of the Second World War the British were going down the Americans were going up so basically the pound was replaced by the dollar uh, so there's a new empire before you have the British Empire then you have the American Empire then the American Empire from 45 to 1990 was in competition with the Soviet Union, but it was always stronger, it was always bigger, mm. richer. Um, and then in 91, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, you had the unipolar moment, so that's from 91 until the Russian invasion of Ukraine, till 22. These 30 years were, were for me, are, are the years where the US empire was the strongest because there was no nobody really standing in its way. It was just, you know, bombing Libya, bombing Syria, bombing Afghanistan, bombing Iraq, uh, doing whatever they wanted, really. Overthrowing the government in Ukraine, trying to overthrow the government in, in Venezuela, which didn't work. But anyway, it was, it was really an empire doing what it wanted. And then with the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, you have the change and you have the rise of the BRICS. I mean, that's my interpretation. The BRICS were there before. But really, that's when Russia stood up and said, enough is enough. And you actually have, most people have not paid attention to this, you have a statement by Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping um, in February 2022, before the invasion, that they are no longer accept NATO expansion to the east. And that was the moment when Peking and Moscow came together and said, enough is enough. And ever since, this enough is enough has grown bigger, you know. It really is the moment, and, and you, you really, you pointed out that the petrodollar is now the, the, the key question. I maybe briefly explain what it is. Between 44 and uh, 1971, the U.S. dollar was as good as gold, okay. It, would be, it was a fixed exchange rate from the dollar to the gold. And then in 71, uh, that was the system of Bretton Woods. And then in 71, President Nixon said, 
G what? You know, we're not going to change our dollars anymore for gold. Because his problem was the Vietnam War was very expensive. He was printing a lot of dollars, but he, he didn't have a lot of gold. So he said, we have to stop this. I mean, it was a good idea to have the dollar and the gold uh, converted, but uh, we, can, we cannot do this anymore. So he just kicked the gold standard in 71. That was, that, that's when the gold standard ended. And then people thought this, this will mean that the dollar will just be like a, like a currency nobody trusts. You know, they will, it will just lose its value before, because the Federal Reserve will just print so many dollars that the currency will default. It will just be worthless. And then Kissinger, uh, foreign minister of, 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 uh, of Nixon, flew to Saudi Arabia. And he did something very clever. He created the petrodollar. He said to Saudi Arabia, now you have a lot of oil here. All the oil that you sell, you sell it in dollars. Mark my words, only in dollars. And then the Saudi said, what do we get in return? And then Kissinger said, we will protect the house of Saud, which is an oligarchy. So the local kings will remain the local kings. You make a lot of money. The only thing is, you buy our weapons and you sell your oil in, in, in dollars. And they said, OK, boss, we'll do that. So that was the petrodollar. And it started in 1971. I was born in 72. So all my life, I've only seen the petrodollar. And now it's very interesting. At the moment after the Soviet, in, uh, uh, sorry, after the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine, and we talked about it before, you have these 300 billion of assets, Russian assets, $300 billion, not rubles, in the West, in NATO countries. And the West says, oh, Russia invaded Ukraine. That's clearly illegal. And it is. It is illegal. You cannot invade another country. So that's why we're going to just freeze these assets. Freeze means, Same with Afghanistan. Yeah. Freeze means you cannot get your money anymore. And now the Russians have said, this is unacceptable. The Chinese have said, this is unacceptable. And now we're coming back to a point we were at before. Saudi Arabia will join the BRICS in January 2024. So in two months, they're going to join the BRICS. That's, that's the roadmap. Which means I expect the petrodollar to slowly die. I mean, Saudi Arabia joins Russia and China, okay, they are forming a new alliance. Most people have not, not even understood what that means. It means the petrodollar is going to die. Now, it doesn't mean that the petrodollar dies like that, you know, because obviously the Chinese and, and the Russians have a lot of dollars, you know, yes. and they dipped. Dipped. They dipped. Yeah. Yeah. They it's, it's, it's like you have, you know, you have a share of a company, I don't know, Tesla. Uh, or, 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 or Apple, and you just have shares of that company, and, and you still have these shares. You don't want the company go, to go bankrupt tomorrow, because then your shares are worth no, zero. So this is going to be, it, uh, um, you know, the financial history always, you know, have, has these periods which, which take quite long. I mean, the pound is not worthless, you know, it's not worth, it's still some value to the pound. But the pound has not the power anymore that it used to have. And that's what I expect for the dollar, a slow decline. Not, a, not an abrupt decline, but I'm looking at figures where you can see that trade between China and Russia has been a lot in dollars and is much less in dollars. You know, it drops, it drops internal trade. And then you take Iran, trade between Iran and China, or you take trade between Saudi Arabia and China. I mean, Saudi Arabia is selling oil to China. Used to be in dollars, now much less. It's going to go towards yuan, which is the Chinese currency. So, yeah, petrodollar is a fascinating story, and I'm fully, fully in, in with you to say that this is the crucial moment for the U.S. empire. If the petrodollar falls, um, that will mean the U.S. empire will decline. No more super carriers for America then. I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, if, 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 you, if you're used to having a printing machine of dollars at home, think, think of it at a private level. If you and I, I mean, you're based in the Netherlands. If you had a machine that you could print euros, 
just like that. And I had a machine that I could print Swiss francs, which is obviously the local currency in Switzerland. Every now and again, at least before we go on a holiday, I'd, I'd print 5,000 Swiss francs. <laughs> so it comes in handy to have 5,000 Swiss francs if you go on a holiday. And you would print 5,000 euros. And you know, after the first holiday and it works nice, you invite all your friends and you print 50,000. I mean, if you have a printing machine, it's just too tempting. It's too tempting. And the US had the printing machine. And obviously, other countries also have a printing machine. But if, if Botswana or, or some, some country out there prints a lot of, of its currency, they just have a hyperinflation and the, and, and the currency decays. That's what we had in Germany in the 1920s. You need a billion marks to buy a, mm. a loaf of bread. It, it has all happened before. For a historian, it's not like, ah, that can't happen. Yes, mm -hmm. it can happen. Many things have happened before. It's just people have forgotten about it. You just said billion. Yeah. If you get every second a dollar or whatever, yeah, it takes 31,000 years. If you get every second a dollar, it takes 31,000 years to get a billion. Just to give you the... Yeah. That's it. Okay. I, didn't know, I didn't know this one. Yeah, it's a yeah, nice yeah. one because billions are something we're like... Abstract. Oh, yeah. This, how much is it? This, this, is, this is a lot of money, but I don't know how much it is. Yeah. And they, they really, they printed so much money. I mean, most of it is just digital. They didn't even print it. They just created it on the laptop. Mm -hmm. Bing. Yeah. And people start to realize this. And I think the people in the peace movement, they just have to educate themselves. So I'm really thankful for, for the work you do and uh, other people out there, Jeffrey Sachs or Sarah Wagenknecht or Michael Lüders and, and Noam Chomsky. And there's, there's a lot of people who, who try to educate people from a, can I say, non-biased perspective. Hmm. Probably not because everybody's biased. I mean, I, I, I probably have my bias. I'm 51 years old and I'm in Switzerland. If I, if I was 80 years old and I was based in China, I would have a different perspective. Or if I was 10 years old and living in the Gaza Strip, I would have, again, another perspective. So we're all biased, but at least let's put it that way. We have now, thanks to the information revolution, thanks to YouTube, we have, we have people out there who, who try to, to speak the truth. I mean, I really try to speak the as truth. As long as YouTube still allows us, because I can see on some of my interviews the numbers of, you know, the impressions, the so-called impressions, how often is the video presented, yeah? It goes up and then it's flat. It's like... You know, yeah. shadow they banning. Look, shadow banning, exactly, exactly. Yeah. On this token, Daniel Eganza, it was a fascinating conversation. I really, really appreciate your time. I massively overstate my welcome. I see a one hour thirty seven minutes. I have a <laughs> meeting very soon coming up. That's that's why we have to close yes, it here. But Thomas, I thanks for yeah. for your question. There were, were, were interesting topics, and uh, I hope it was interesting for your audience and. Uh, we, we can okay. talk again in, let's say, two years. I, I always have to say... Not, I put not this in my calendar in two yeah. years. In yes, two years, yes, yes. we can talk again. Okay, okay. okay. Good talking For to now, you. thank you so much talking to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas.